Vice President. <laughs> Center, I mean. Thank you very much, Madam. Mr. Vice President, I take this opportunity to join in this debate and act to amend the Bail Act, Chapter 460. Mr. Vice President, we are here today because the government is failing in its duty and its responsibility to fix the social problems in this country. And they have taken the opportunity to come to get this parliament to legitimize excessively harsh and severe measures in a hope that it will solve the problem. It will not work. Mr. Vice President, this government has failed to deal with the social problems that give rise to the at-risk youth whom I have spoken about on numerous occasions in this parliament. The marginalized the citizens who resort to a life of crime because of the poor and disproportionate distribution of wealth and income in this country. Because of a sense of injustice between the haves and the have-nots. If this government did its job, they will not have to bring plaster legislation to cover the festering sore of crime and violence in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Vice President, as long as the perception exists, whether it is true or untrue, that there are senior government ministers closely affiliated to the drug trade in Trinidad and Tobago, blood will continue to flow in our streets. Senator. Senator, as much as you are literally two minutes into your contribution and you're creating that context, the statement that you're making to the average individual could be misconstrued as imputing improper motives. I understand the context that you're trying to create, but when you use that particular phrase, it can be taken as though it's imputing improper motives to the current government. Yes. Mr. Vice President, I will rephrase. As long as the, as the perception exists, true or untrue, that senior persons in our society are closely affiliated to the drug trade in Trinidad and Tobago, blood will continue to flow in the streets of our nation. As long as there is a perception that justice is for some and not for all, there will continue to be war in the ghettos. As long as you have first class and second class citizens, the 1% versus the 99%, unless we reduce social advantages, un unless we level the playing field for access to opportunities, we will live under siege. The government must tackle the root of the problem. In my view, Mr. Vice President, many of the PNM's policies further widen the gap between the haves and the have-nots. The PNM is a big part of the problem in Trinidad and Tobago. So today, we, the government has asked us to consider certain amendments to the Bail Act, which would see the denial of bail to certain accused and which would put more persons in remand. You have no solution for the problem of overcrowding in the prisons. No solution for the situation and the circumstances in the remand but you have come with this oppressive piece of legislation to ask you, us, the opposition and independent, to support you to put more people in that same remand yard under those conditions. 
Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, I want to let you know that in this country, people are angry, people are outraged. They have reached a point in this nation where if you call an election tomorrow, the PNM will disappear from the landscape of governance. And that is because as far as they are concerned, the government is doing nothing to deal with the real problems confronting people. Economic security, social security, national security. It is failure after failure after failure. They are not presenting a solution. They are not part of the solution even. In fact, they are, the pro they are part yeah, of the problem. problem. They are the problem. So before we consider what, you know, before we consider these measures, I want to ask the government to be clear in what is your purpose for this measure. The purpose of bail is to ensure that the person shows up for their proceedings in court. The remand and the denial of bail is not a punishment. Because you are guilty, you are innocent until proven guilty. So if it is the government's intention to use the denial of bail as a form of punishment, immediately you run into trouble. By definition, bail is a temporary release of an accused person awaiting trial. An accused person, not a guilty person. Sometimes on condition that money is lodged to guarantee their, uh, their appearance in court. So this uh, security, whether it is cash or bond or property, is pledged or given to the court by or on behalf of one accused of committing a crime to obtain release from incarceration and to ensure the person's future appearance in court when required during criminal proceedings. It works, Madam, Mr. Vice President, because if the accused fail to appear before the court, the bail could be revoked. And he or she would then be remanded in custody. It is not because this person might be afraid to lose the money that was put forward or lose the property. It works because they want to avoid being on remand. And Mr. Vice President, that brings me to remand. And I think this is a good opportunity for the government to account to the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago for some of its promises. Time and time again, we always come across broken promises left by this government. Um, in a previous debate, I, I, I can't remember if it was on the bail bill, but in a previous debate, I remember the Attorney General sharing with this parliament that the average cost of treating with a prisoner is around $25,000 per month. And that covered food and transport and, 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 and other amenities uh, when you do a, a head count. It is in the interest of the state to reduce the cost of uh, keeping these prisoners. Or is it? Between 80 and 90 million dollars is spent a year just on prison transport. Yet the state, over successive political incarnations, have failed to have courts located close to or in <coughs> prison. And we have to ask ourselves as a conscious thinking nation, Whose interest does it serve to spend 80 to 90 million dollars a year in transport alone for the prisons? The conditions at the prisons, the conditions at remand, because we are speaking about a period before a person is sentenced so that this accused will be on remand. We have heard countless horror stories, Mr. Vice President, of the conditions of the uh, crowded accommodation of the pail bucket system of waste disposal. And I recall, I came across an article that was a, a newspaper article where the government indicated that the government had approved 
$2.6 million for prison upgrades. And the first line indicates, and I quote, prisoners at the Golden Grove Remand Prison will soon find relief from using the PAL system as cabinet has approved TT 53.6 million for the upgrade of the facility's sanitation, sewer, and plumbing systems, end quote. The article further quoted the then Minister of National Security, the Honorable Minister Dillon, who indicated, quote, this upgrade will look at the wastewater and sewer treatment, plumbing, electrical system, the ventilation, and the CCTV system. He said that while there's a plan for a long-term remand facility, which will be actioned within five years, he said the present financing is being done to address immediate concerns. This was in 2017. Two of those five years have gone. I have never heard an update with regards to the, the improvement of the conditions at the remand prisons. It is possible that it is ongoing, and the government has not had an opportunity to account us for the $53.6 million allocated. And this debate is an ideal opportunity. So I want to encourage somebody from the government side to take the opportunity to uh, tell us what happened with that. If we are going to take measures that will increase the population in remand, my question, has the government or anyone on its behalf had any consultation with the Commissioner of Prisons, with the Association of Prison Officers? We have had numerous instances where the safety and security of prison officers have been compromised, has been under threat. Prison officers have been speaking out on it. The overcrowding in remand is part of the problem and this situation could see more persons on remand, and it is very important for us to have consultation with the, um, the stakeholders, the, particularly the officers who are there to treat, to hold and treat, and their security and safety is important. Their safety, right, and Mr. Vice President, also important in consulting with them is to ascertain the manpower requirement given the expected increase or the expected number of persons who might be on remand because they do not qualify for bail. So those are some issues you must discuss with them. Mr. Vice President, some years ago in 2011, this parliament passed the electronic monitoring bill. That is another measure, Mr. Vice President, that we have not heard about, and it allows the police to track the whereabouts of accused persons. This is a, a, a mechanism that we could use to reduce the, um, the denial of bail. The purpose of bail is to ensure that the person comes to court. The purpose, in fact, is to secure so that they would not, you know, you don't want them to escape the jurisdiction, go to another country. But if you can track their whereabouts, there will be no need to deny them bail. This is an, a measure that would, not, that would help deal with the overcrowding and the remand, and I think it has to be given consideration. I don't know if any mem of the members opposite has any, have any update on that, and that is something that, if it's not answered in this debate, I intend to bring a question because I think it's a good opportunity for um, matters like that to come to the parliament for um, the nation to know what's going on. Mr. Vice President, uh, during the lunch break, um, on my return from the lunch break, I met uh, some documents uh, which was distributed to all members and I believe it came from the Attorney General and much of it is um, copies of statistics from Crime and Problem Analysis Branch of the TTPS. And some of this was, some of these statistics were referred to by the Attorney General. 
um, arrests under various of the um, offenses identified in this act to deny bail, arrest under anti-terrorism, arrest under larceny, arrest under fraudry, the Fraudry Act, Sexual Offenses Act, um, serious crime detection rate, um, and, and so on. Mr. Vice President, while I appreciate the bundle that the Attorney General has sent, um, I think it, very important is to take into consideration with this a uh, matter that my colleague, Senator Saddam Hussein, raised earlier. And uh, um, looking at the arrest rate is one thing, Mr. Vice President, gives us an idea of how many people may have been accused of the crime. The, um, n the number of cases that reach, that go through the court and you get a guilty conviction and then subsequent sentencing is also important. How many people get off? Also very critical in, uh, for us to consider is the, the number of years that these matters take to be resolved. Attorneys who practice can give you points um, of hiccups from simple thing like getting the, the client's criminal record. So while I, it's, it's okay to see the number of arrests, I think we, it, the, the, the statistics brought by my colleague, Senator Hussein, about the length of time cases take to come to an end. And we are talking about, in many cases, six years, six years to 20 years for, these, for the crimes that have been identified in this bill. Uh, do we intend to deny a person bail for this length of time for them to languish at the remand yard in its present conditions with the slow pace of the justice system in our country, it is very likely then that their time on remand would exceed the time they could be sentenced to if they are found guilty. So while I do agree that there are a number of, um, that the offenses identified, that there needs to be a clamp down, a crack down, uh, offenses under the Anti-Gang Act, the Dangerous Drugs Act, kidnapping, sexual offenses, and particularly sexual offenses against a child, terrorism, trafficking in persons, and firearm offenses. Mr. Vice President, we have to look at the crime um, We have to look at the, when we decide to restrict bail, the, what has this government done to improve access to justice? Areas that I feel, Mr. Vice President, that in fact I know that the previous government had been working on assiduously and had some success in, includes well-equipped police service, well-staffed and well-resourced public prosecutors, Functional courts in rural areas. We have heard time again about Princess Tongue and Rio Claro Magistrates Court and the conditions in several of those areas. Easily accessible legal aid for those who need it. Paying the legal aid attorneys on time and perhaps considering increasing what they do get. Having an efficient justice system. Having safety for prisoners and accused persons. These are some measures that I think we have to improve before we say we want to deny people bail. I want to go now, Mr. Vice, Mr. Vice President, into some specific areas. The present bill before us, the new clause 521, no, person for a, no bail for a person charged under the new part two of the first schedule that has been a previously convicted of an offense which is punishable by imprisonment for 10 years or more. So the government is essentially saying, listen, people who commit these serious crime, you, wanna, you don't want to give them the opportunity to go back again. Um, the new clause 53A, no bail for possession of a firearm, possession of ammunition or prohibited weapon, as the case may be. Um, it might sound good, Mr. Vice President, what is the government doing to get guns off the streets? 
What is the government doing to prevent guns from coming into our country? So by the time it reaches into the citizen's hand, the young boy, the youth man, who feel that it has no alternative but to have a gun and commit robbery, by the time it reaches him, he is the small man who taken the fall for the Mr. Big that has been hiding. No, um, new clause 5.3b, no bail for a person charged with an offense listed in part two of the first schedule and has a pending charge for an offense specified in the part, in the said part two. Um, there's also new, new five, clause 5.3c, no bail for a person charged for an offense listed in part two of the first schedule and the court is informed by the prosecutor that the person used a firearm for the commission of the offense. So I have some concerns. This could be very dangerous. We know, Mr. Pre Mr. President, I know of times, um, and I have colleagues who are practicing attorneys, I have persons who do social work who encounter accused, um, could tell you that this provision could be abused by prosecutors. And this provision simply calls for an indication by the prosecution that a firearm was used. At this stage of the trial, no proof needs to be demonstrated. Just an indication to the court. So an offense is committed and you indicate that a firearm was used. Of course, <clears throat> Mr. President, the firearm or the thing, Mr. Vice President, the firearm or the thing alleged to be a firearm has to be tested and proven to be a firearm. And then you have the Forensic Science Center, which I wouldn't touch on right now because it's so much. But let's say an accused person is charged for kidnapping only. So there's no possession of a firearm. No firearm was found. The prosecution indicates that they have information that a firearm was used in the commission of the offense, um, the kidnapping offense. But they have not found any gun. No gun went to forensics. Nothing like that. The court then, if this, uh, this amendment is accepted, would then have to refuse bail just based on that indication. In practice, this could be used by unscrupulous police prosecutors and trust for the police. And we have seen numerous instances, trust for the police in this country is another issue. But this could be used just to deprive persons of their liberty. So thereafter, no gun has to ever be produced, and no charge for possession of firearm may ever be laid against the accused. But they would be denied bail. So this, there has to be some consideration and an amendment to say possibly that if the prosecution does not lay any firearm-related charge against the accused within a specified time, a reasonable time, Attorneys could recommend based on their practice, whether it is one week, um, 21 days, um, that the accused would then be allowed access to bail. So we cannot leave a situation like that to language and the possibility of abuse. Because if the police doesn't get the gun in, that, in a certain specified space of time, I mean, sometimes things magically appear and disappear. I don't know if it would just... If, it do, if they don't find the gun within a reasonable time, say one week or, or, or three weeks, are they going to, to find it in three years? How long are you going to just keep this situation pending? So that is something that, um, that I have a concern about, and I, we will deal with that at the committee stage. New Clause 5.4. Um, if no evidence has been taken or led before the court, be it a master or a magistrate, relative to the offense in 5.2 and 5.3, in 120 days, the accused may apply for bail um, by a judge in chambers. New Clause 5.5a, no bail for a parent who has a child living with them under the anti-gang who is deemed to be a gang leader. Um, New Clause 5.5b, where bail is granted in relation to 55A, which is the um, parent with the child under the um, anti-gang. If no evidence in the, is led in 60 days, they could go before a judge in chambers. New 5.6, no bail for an accused charge under um, 
five to one, and it has been found that the accused has a conviction for a matter similar to that listed in part two of the first schedule in a, in a competent foreign jurisdiction. Mr. Price President, <clears throat> um, so first of all, the section says that it has to be found. So it means that it has to go for tracing. You have to get a fully record. The police has, will be given time to get the, the record, the criminal record, and so on. But attorneys who represent clients, criminal clients, know that tracing and producing the criminal record to the court doesn't happen overnight. Even an ordinary citizen who has to get a fully certificate of character has to wait some time. And when it goes to court, it takes much longer than that. In many cases, um, the criminal record is not, sometimes not made available at the first hearing, and the magistrate would say, I'll give you some time again, come back again. So there again, it is postponed. The new criminal proceedings rule indicate that tracing must be made available within two days of charge, or the court can grant bail. So, um, so if it is found on the first date, is it that you, you're going to grant bail, or is it that they have to find your criminal record? But whenever they find the criminal record, the prosecutor can indicate that he has it and that your bail can be revoked. So there may be a contradiction there, because if in one instance you are saying that the, um, according to the criminal proceedings rule, that tracing must be made available within two days of charge, or the, or the court could grant bail. And then, on the other hand, if the, the prosecutor could come forward, sometimes it's three weeks, sometimes three months after that initial bail is granted under the, criminal, the new criminal proceedings rule, he could come after and say, I have a record that falls under one of these sections that this person should be denied bail is that then do you revoke the bill. Um, so, so you could have an indication from the prosecutor. Um, do you then have an indication from the prosecutor and have the court or the magistrate wait on the criminal record and disregard the criminal proceedings rule or do you go with, um, with denying the, um, the bill completely? Secondly, Mr. Vice President, in this group of clauses that I've taken here, the, this section speaks to criminal records and convictions in a competent foreign jurisdiction. A competent foreign jurisdiction, when it comes to matters of extradition, for example, is defined as jurisdictions where our country has an extradition treaty. So if there's a country where we, ha we have an extradition arrangement. We call it a competent foreign jurisdiction. Is there any definition for competent jurisdiction as it pertains to bail? Um, and it, we could probably be guided. So for the criminal record, um, I mean, what is, would be considered not a competent jurisdiction as opposed to a competent jurisdiction. Mr. Vice President, attorneys who practice in Trinidad and Tobago do matters for people of different nationalities, people from Venezuela, of course, people from Colombia, the Dominican Republic. Um, they deal with objections from the prosecution related to the criminal record for these persons. Um, and these criminal records have to come from our local division or from Interpol. But then you also have a question again of the time. Um, and these attorneys would have to request, um, request the record. And it takes a very long time. In fact, in some instances, they never receive the record. Um, but the reality is it takes quite some time to procure it. And then you have somebody waiting for that criminal record to come forward. So this, this measure could really be abused. And Mr. Vice President, saying that in light of 
Um, just a few hours ago, there was a, um, an article put out on the electronic media from CCN TV6 where three police officers were charged with, um, I have it right here. They, they, were, they were charged with um, falsely imprisoning and robbing a 51-year-old man last year. There are numerous instances of uh, um, situations where police officers abuse the system. There are even instances when police officers have personal motive to do so. And there are instances when police officers are alleged to be part of a criminal ring. And you would see that targeting to get rid of a certain person from circulation. Um, and so have them before the court and denied bail before the matter could be, and it would be years before the matter could be adequately ventilated. Uh, Mr. Vice President, I want to also mention a concern for what happens on remand. What happens to a person who lives under the circumstances in remand? What happens to them mentally and emotionally? Recently, there was a joint select committee, the Human Rights Equality and Diversity Committee, had a hearing on the impact on mental health and family life of the remandees at remand prison. And there were some interesting findings there. Do we really want to send more people to possibly create criminal-minded persons to create people whose mental wellness and well-being is compromised, who return to society <laughs> with, with, with mean thoughts and mean objectives in their minds and in their hearts, um, to put it mildly. But remind the others are breeding ground for criminals. Even people who have the best intention sometimes have to side with a gang for protection and bear survival. It is a recruitment ground for gangs. It is a training ground for criminals. You are literally breeding more criminals when you deny more people bail and send them to re remand. You are creating a bigger problem. Right. Mr. Vice President, <coughs> the, the, I know that justice is a, is a philosophical thing. Um, it is a concept of rightness and correctness in terms of ethics. Justice is concerned with both the prescriptive nature in terms of what is just, um, that is what should be done, and then the response to actions that go against what is just, including retribution. So while justice might be a bit of a nebulous concept, we all have a view, um, but we can recognize it when we see it. Sometimes more so when we do not see it. We can identify injustices in actions and things we observe in society, in decisions that are made. Um, so, Mr. Vice President, I feel very strongly, I have a strong sense of justice and I don't want to go off talking about the philosophical concept of justice and how this is denied in this debate. But this bill makes it possible for a person to be accused of an offense, denied bail, and um, for a very frivolous, um, possibly a very frivolous accusation, or should I say, an unbased, uh, something without basis, without much basis. It can be used to victimize people. And Mr. Vice President, let me say, I am in no way saying let criminals go get off scot-free. I am particularly concerned about crime and violence in our society. You see the, the, the list of offenses I called earlier, Mr. Um, President, Mr. Vice President, things under the Anti-Gang Act, kidnapping, sexual offenses, and particularly for sexual offenses against uh, children, trafficking in person, firearms, license. Mr. Vice President, we have to clamp down on these things happening. We have to make guns less available. We have to make drugs less available. We have to go as a nation and the state has to go after the big boys and the big fish in the drug trade. Mr. Vice President, when it comes to sexual offenses, we as leaders have a lot to make up for in terms of how we speak and how we treat with victims of sexual offenses. We, Mr. Vice President, have to reduce 
the trial time, the long trial time in our, our, um, in our justice system. The Forensics Science Center is in a mess. They have many challenges. They have many challenges, and I know some of my other colleagues will speak about that because it is an issue that is very relevant to this debate. The DPP, the resources, the human resources in particular, the accommodation, the challenges of the DPP has been shared in this debate in, at JSCs in this parliament, and it is also very relevant. If it takes six to 20 years for trials to be completed, trials that fall under this, um, these type of offenses, um, that, Mr. Vice President, goes against the spirit of justice. So had these measures been brought in the circumstances where you had an efficient justice system, where you had shorter time periods, where you had less corrupt police officers, <coughs> where you had DPP who are well equipped and, and, and forensic evidence that is beyond reproach, I could, I could find myself possibly agreeing. But in the given circumstances, Mr. Vi Vice President, I can't. I also, must, Mr. Vice President, I, you know, I always speak about the need for police social work intervention, early intervention within communities. I want to take this opportunity to commend the police youth clubs, mm -hmm. um, particularly the one in Diego Martin, Mr. Shabodin, and the one in Orokun, who I personally worked with, and I see the good work that they do. But all of them, um, I want to reiterate the need for the use of dispute resolution opportunities within the justice system. The previously proposed Ministry of Just the Justice Complex at Trinity, which was proposed under the People's Partnership Government, which the opposition at the time um, protested against, that complex had space for dispute resolution in a big way, and that is the direction we should be going. We should be expanding um, duty council services. Um, I mentioned already the legal aid, the poor legal aid lawyers who just had to wait so long to get their, their little fees. You know, I also want to encourage that we should have um, perhaps look at funds for disbursement when lawyers do pro bono work. Lawyers who choose to do pro bono work in this country have to bear the cost of filing and all those other little administrative costs. And it is, it is very possible for, um, for there to be a system to reimburse people who take that decision to give civic duty. Um, Mr. Vice President, we have to, and I'm sure there have been studies by criminologists in this country, we have to identify the blockages in the court system and systematically work on reducing it over various administrations. That has to be an objective in this nation if we have to see justice being swift, if we are to see cr uh, crime reduced, if we are to see um, a fair-minded and, fair and even-handed um, system of justice in our country that does not have the prejudice that people perceive it does have now in terms of the haves between the haves and the have-nots. Mr. Vice President, this is a bill I think that is a, an opportunity for um, uh, one thing I must say in closing, Mr. Vice President, the Attorney General, when in his contribution, indicated that when the PNM was in opposition and the partnership was in government, there are many pieces of legislation that the PNM voted with. And I'll tell you the huge difference in this and in other measures that the Attorney General has brought. When we were in government, the People's Partnership consulted with stakeholders, had meaningful consultation. That does not happen under the present government. The government and opposition very often sat and worked out and made suggestions for amendments so that when a bill came before the parliament, even though the partnership, the People's Partnership, had the required majority and could, didn't need the PNM's vote, we still sat and had collaboration. This government doesn't care to do that. It doesn't care to have consultation and have the legal minds in our country have their input. And that is the huge difference. That is why you will not get the support, because you bring bad law. 
if you sit together and we have collaboration and you bring good law, you will get the support of the opposition, as we have proven on numerous occasions. In fact, the recently com concluded yes, sexual yeah. offenses registry bill is one is no. one that, no. uh, that was just in the no, last no, no. debate. So, yet. Mr. Vice President, I want to urge that we have more measures like that, and I want to thank you for this opportunity to contribute. Senator Thompson, I. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. As a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, I can well understand the sentiments that have, has, that have moved the Attorney General to bring this bill before this House. I read the newspapers every day. Unlike many of my professional colleagues who, told, who tell me from time to time they no longer buy newspapers, I spend, I think it's $9 a day, buying the main newspapers. And when I read the court reports, which speak about, which write about, I should say, court hearings, about someone being sentenced for an offense involving firearms and that that offense was committed while that person was on bail for a similar offense, I ask myself, what is happening here? What is happening with these personnel who adjudicate on these cases, can they not see? Can they not hear? Can they not understand? And sometimes I am quite annoyed and frustrated. So I understand the sentiments. I understand the concern. And I agree, something has to be done. But you know, in spite of my preamble, I do have to part company with the Attorney General. The Bail Amendment Act, in its present form, removes the discretion from the judiciary to determine whether the constitutional right to bail conflicts with article, with, with, conflicts with the right of the individual. So is it what we, the, the act, the bill that we bring in here, does it infringe any rights? And I heard it this morning from a government senator that there is no constitutional right to bail. And I went back into my constitution. And I looked at the article that dealt with the right to liberty. And I said, does it not happen that when I cannot get bail, when someone cannot get bail, there is no, that the right to liberty is in fact interfered with? What about the presumption of innocence? What about the fact that under the Constitution, you have a right to be released on bail? So that if the, 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 the right to bail is being restricted, in fact, even if I have excessive bail imposed upon me, the right to bail is being interfered with. I am not saying that that right to bail should not be interfered with. Not at all. There are instances where it ought to be. But when it comes in conflict with what I hold dear to my heart, the right of children, when principles of child justice are being interfered with, 
Well, then we must part company. Trinidad and Tobago, like all other countries of the world, except the United States, and I am fond of telling them that, they don't like to hear it, has ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. We did that in December 1991. Further to that, we mounted, we in the Caribbean, had a conference, the Caribbean Conference on the Rights of the Child. And we gathered in Belize City, when I say we, I mean the Caribbean people, and we produced this report, the Caribbean Conference on the Rights of the Child, meeting the post-ratification challenge. And in this document, we came up with another a specific document, commitment to the rights of the child. The Belize commitment to action for the rights of the child. Signing that commitment on our behalf was the Honorable Manoha Ramsaran. It fell within his remit at the time. And one of the things that we committed to do was to review and revise the relevant laws, policies, and programs to fully comply with the letter and the spirit of the CRC, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So whatever we do, whatever laws we pass, we must comply with the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the letter and the spirit. And so often, we forget the spirit. We undertook as well to make, in Article 42, the principles and provisions of the Convention widely known to adults and children alike. That is in Article 42. And when I sit here, I say to myself, why are we falling down on this? Because so many times I find that as a parliament, as a people, we are not familiar with the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Having ratified, we had the obligation to report. And we have reported from time to time. We're always late. We're very late, but we do report. And after reporting, the Committee on the Rights of the Child, which is the, the group of 18 experts who receive, who look at our report and say where we've done well, we, they always find something good to say about us, about everybody, because we want to encourage people. And then we say what needs to be done. And one of the things that the committee said, based on our last report, in their concluding observation was to undertake systematic education and training on the rights of the Convention for Children and their parents, as well as professional groups. So we, the state party, is supposed to do that. It's professional groups working for and with children, in particular parliamentarians, judges, magistrates, lawyers, law enforcement officials, civil servants, personnel working in institutions and places of detention for children, teachers, health personnel, and social workers. So this is the concluding observation on Trinidad and Tobago's report, the 2006 um, concluding observations. Now what article I'm sure you're waiting to hear? What am I talking about? What is the article that has been infringed? And I speak here of Article 37 of the Convention. And Article 37 says, that no child shall be deprived of his or her liberty unlawfully or arbitrarily, but the important part is that detention or imprisonment of a child shall be in conformity with the law and shall be used only as a measure of last resort and for the shortest appropriate period of time. So when we're talking about the shortest appropriate period of time, therein lies the rub, which indicates that somebody must determine what is the shortest appropriate period of time. So there ought to be some determination 
of what is the shortest appropriate time for a juvenile. So once you take away the original discretion, it means that somebody else, and this legislature is purporting to do that, to determine that 120 days is in fact a period, which is three months, and as I made, I said last week in the Senate, when you're dealing with juveniles, when you're dealing with the more acceptable with his children, you must think of time in a different way from when you are talking about children, when you are with adults. Now, because there has been so much confusion about child justice, the Committee on the Rights of the Child went a bit further and put out a document called the, child, the General Comment Number 10, Children's Rights in Juvenile Justice. And that document was to encourage state parties to develop and implement a comprehensive juvenile justice policy based on compliance with the CRC. So anytime we're doing anything that's going to affect children, we have to look for guidance from that document. What are the recommendations? for a comprehensive juvenile justice policy. And it talks about pretrial detention, children languishing itself in pretrial detention for months constitutes a grave violation of Article 37 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And it speaks about the need for there being an effective package of alternatives being available for state parties if they are to fulfill their obligations under the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Now, Mr. Vice President, when we talk about child justice, we're talking about individualized justice. We must look at the question of proportionality, and we must ensure that whatever penalties we impose, whatever we do, it must be fitting to the circumstances, not only of the offense. So what we're looking here in this bill, Bill, we're looking at offenses. But when you're talking about children, you must look at both the offenses, the commission of the offenses, and you must also look at the particular offender because we are talking individualized justice. We have another principle. So we have rehabilitation. We have best interest of the child. We have the child's right to life survival and development and all of these things are impacted by how we treat juveniles, how we treat children who are in conflict with the law. One of my colleagues this morning mentioned restorative justice, and I, every week I, I, I mention restorative justice, because we have a system of retributive justice which asks, how do we punish the offender? That's the question we ask. How do we punish the offender? So we have a list of offenses, and this bail bill is to deal with the offenses by punishing the offender, by keeping that offender away from society. But what I want to emphasize is that when we are dealing with child offenders, we must do more than that. We must look to restorative justice, which asks, how do we restore the well-being of the child, the victim, and the community? It has been well documented that deprivation of liberty has negative consequences for the child's harmonious development and seriously hampers the child's reintegration into society. And I quote here from the committee's um, their general comment number 10, which was brought out in 2007, and it's now is going to next time the
committee meets, they are actually looking at revising that again. So we want to do what is best for children. We want to do what is right by children. So we try to avoid a situation where bail is kept away from them for a lengthy period of time. We try to avoid a situation where excessive bail is given because if you have excessive bail, it really amounts to no bail at all. And that is the position in which they can find themselves. When we look at the circumstances, sometimes for the offense, and I spoke last week about a young boy who is you know, devastated, who has now a mental problem because he's waiting for his preliminary inquiry, and it's a case where it's a sexual offense. So we want really to try to have the children in our society as wholesome children. So I am willing to support a bail bill that will deny for a period of time, a reasonable period of time, a situation where there is no bail. But when it comes to juvenile, I want to insist that we look at the principle of individualized justice. We look at the principle of proportionality. We look at rehabilitation. And we look at reintegration. Because when you have someone in an institution where they, which is really a training school at times, some of them come out being much better educated in terms of crime than the people who are in the society. So we want a situation where we can save our youth. So we're not, not going to be looking only at saving the society, because if we don't save our youth, we are, in fact, destroying our society, a society that we have to live in. So I would urge the government to look at this bill again, look at the implications for child justice, see what you can do in terms of removing the restrictions for this lengthy period without bail, and come again. And perhaps then it would be pleasing to me. And perhaps then you can get my support. I thank you, Mr. Vice President. Senator Chut. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, for the opportunity to speak on the proposed amendment to the Bail Act. Um, one of the first things I learned when I was appointed as an independent senator was that your guiding light is really the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. So I think that's where we should start. And I want to place this on the record. I know my friend referred to it, but section 5F, 5-2-F says, that uh, you are not allowed to deprive a person charged with a criminal offense of the right to be presumed innocent until proved guilty according to law. I think that's important. But this shall not invalidate a law by reason only that the law imposes on any such person the burden of proving particular facts. Well, that doesn't really um, apply to us. Two, to a fair and public hearing by an independent and impartial tribunal, or three, to reasonable bail without just cause. And how this works, the reasonable bail without just cause, we can see an example of how legislatively that is possible when we look at the Bail Act, which was passed with a constitutional majority. Because if we look at the Bail Act, while the Constitution says that you are entitled to reasonable bail and so on, Section 6 of the Act says, well, while that is true, and in particular 6.2a, 
It says where the court is satisfied that there are substantial grounds for believing that the defendant, if released on bail, would fail to surrender to custody, commit an offense while on bail, or interfere with witnesses or otherwise obstruct the course of justice, whether in relation to himself or any other person, the court is entitled to refuse bail. And there are many categories like that where under the Bail Act, a court hearing an application for bail or considering an application for bail is able to say that regardless of whether you have previous convictions or not, or whether this is the first time you are arrested, the court can refuse you bail. So we already have legislation which is quite draconian in its, uh, in its potential and indeed in its operation. <coughs> so I would like us to be clear as to what the, the status of the law is. Now, it seems to me that the thinking behind this proposed piece of legislation is a certain amount of anxiety about uh, firearms and the impact that firearms have on uh, criminal activity in the country. Well, who would not be concerned about that? But to me, placing someone in custody for 120 days and telling them, well, you remain there until you can get bail, is not taking any firearms off the street. Yeah. It's taking a person off the street, his firearms, unless he is taking it, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon? I'm sorry, Madam President, I thought I heard something. Um, unless that person is taking his firearms stash into the prison with him, then his firearms on the outside working for him while he's inside. So if this is the thinking behind what we want to cure, then really there is a disconnect between the problem that we are trying to solve and the resolution, the legislative resolution that is being offered to this honorable house today. Now, perhaps I should then go on <clears throat> to look at the statistics provided by the Honorable Attorney General, and they have been very helpful in my consideration of whether I ought to support this proposed amendment or not. What I do see, and I think all senators may have it, what I do see for the year 2019, well, we are in June, that 212 firearms, we are six months into the year, and 212 firearms have been found and seized. Now, I don't know what the statistics were at June for 2017 and 2018, but if we are to gauge it seems as though we are lapsing in terms of our uh, location and seizure of the firearms which are out there and which may be being used to commit crimes. So if we go to the next page and we look at reports of firearm-related offenses, let's only look at 2019. We see, okay, there are 419 reports to date of firearm-related offenses. But when we look at arrests for the possession of firearms for the same period, we see that there have only been 140. So you see that the point I'm trying to make is that numbers don't always tell us the correct story. If we look, we talk about one of the proposals is to include offenses under the Anti-Gang anti Act into the schedule where the person would not be able to get bail for 120 days and so on. Okay, so let's see. 
in 2018, one arrest under the Anti-Gang Act, 2019, five. Arrest under the Larceny Act for 2019, um, serious crimes, 40, minor crimes, 28. Although the Honorable Attorney General has said that there might be some um, ambivalence about whether larceny and receiving should be included in the schedule. Arrests under the Dangerous Drugs Act for 2019. So far, in June 2019, is 148. Now we're talking about arrests, not charge, right? Because this is what is headed here. Arrests under the Anti-Terrorism Act for 2018. We, we, well, apparently we haven't had any for 2019, which I think should be wonderful for us. Arrests under the Anti-Terrorism Act for 2018 is one. Arrests under the Trafficking in Persons Act, and this one is actually quite terrifying, zero. Arrests under the Kidnapping Act for 2019, 16. Last year, arrests under the Kidnapping Act, well, the, for, for 2018 was 119, second only to the number for 2012, which was 141. Arrests under the Forgery Act for 2019, June 2019, 35. Serious crimes detection rate. And out of 3,869 serious crimes reported, the detection rate has been 1,089. Now, I suspect a detection rate may mean when a charge is laid in the matter. So let's look at the next page, Arrests for Sexual Offenses 2019. Um, in all, we've had 36. Now, I accept that criminal activity doesn't go up a sliding scale or doesn't move down a sliding scale, but I think it is th these figures would give us an idea as to, first, are we using the right approach to solve the problem that we want to solve? And secondly, is the approach that we are taking proportionate? <coughs> now, If I may refer to a report in the Newsday of the 9th of June, 2019, there was a report which um, dealt with the Commission of Police talking about ballistics. And the reporter said, there was an admission by the Commission of Police that ballistics testing on weapons fired in a shooting incident at Caranage that killed 14-year-old Naomi Nelson could take up to six years. So you are saying that we are dealing with a problem of firearms and firearm-related offenses by incarcerating persons charged for these offenses for 120 days without bail in breach of what appears to be their constitutional rights. And yet you are also saying that there really is no possibility or there is a very small possibility that this person will come to trial or even have his trial completed within one year. I accept that there have been things which have speeded up the justice system, judge alone trial and that kind of thing. But I also do know that judge alone trial 
can't solve the problem of the Forensic Science Center. And I have been in the courtroom often enough to observe, and I have heard from prosecutors at the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, that there are murder trials that they cannot start or cannot proceed with because the exhibits were sent for DNA testing at the DNA lab, which apparently has been non-functional for about a year to 18 months. I have no doubt, no reason to doubt these prosecutors making these representations to the court. So it seems as though there, are, there is a significant aspect of the criminal justice process that we need to take into account in determining whether we are going to touch the sensitive issue of detracting from a constitutional right outside of the existing law. I totally agree with my colleague, Senator Thompson IE, who says that the, as, as lawyers, we always have a concern when legislators want to take something outside of the courtroom and to have it determined by parliament. And I must say that essentially what we are doing here is we are trying to put in an ouster clause, but this is not a contract case or any other civil case that you may think about, and even in those cases, ouster clause are frowned upon. We are trying to put in an ouster clause for a constitutional right. Mm -hmm. That is how this important this is. Now, at my age, unfortunately, I think I've become a little too familiar with some of the processes which result in legislation of this kind. So, I was intimately involved in 2010 when then Attorney General, um, I think it had been Annan, Mr. Annan Ramlogan at the time, had been trying to have a similar, if not the same piece of legislation passed. And he had a sort the opinion of the then Criminal Bar Association, which was in existence, which, whose president was Mrs. Pamela Elder SC. And there was a joint select committee in 2010, which took into account the paper provided by the Criminal Bar Association. And in the report actually records its thanks to the then Criminal Bar Association. Now, what the B Criminal Bar Association had basically said is that it could not, and it set out the reasons, it could not support the proposed amendment to have someone locked away for 120 days. And reasons were given for this. And these comments were placed before Parliament and before a joint select committee as long ago as 2010. It ought to be on Parliament's website because I know that usually the reports are there together with the evidence provided. Now, let's move on to 2013. Under the previous government, president of the Law Association at the time was then senior counsel, Sinas Jairam. So lawyers were invited to a meeting with various ministers to talk about this proposed amendment to the Bail Act. And we made it quite clear to the then um, government that we were opposed to 
this period of 120 days with no bail, and we set out, set out our reasons. But one of the more important reasons that we set out to the then group of ministers was that it didn't take into account the fact that in our law, there are deeming provisions in the Firearms Act and in the Dangerous Drugs Act. So what this means is that persons found in a vehicle in which there is a firearm or persons found in an apartment in which there is a firearm may find all of them all of them being charged by the police because of the deeming provision. And all of those persons caught by these deeming provisions would not be entitled to bail for 120 days. Uh, when I close, I will give not hypothetical examples, but I will give examples of two actual instances where citizens of this country suffered because of the abuse of the existing law by the police. Now, after our meeting on the 14th of March, 2013, and I can speak of it because I was there, we received an email from the then uh, head of the Law Commission asking us, since it may be harsh to deny bail to a person found in possession of drugs near a school, which is Senator Hussein's point, which may include a school child, how can the bill be amended to create an exception to the no bail provision? Nonetheless, despite the views of the lawyers, the legislation was enacted. And after its expiry, there was an attempt to renew its life. So the Law Association, again, was consulted on this matter. Law Association issued a press release. It said, in April 2015, the association advised then Attorney General, Senator Garvin Nicholas, that given the constitutional guarantees of reasonable bail, compared, uh, sorry, um, added to the presumption of innocence and the right to be brought promptly before an appropriate judicial authority. The association considered the proposed legislation then to be a disproportionate measure. The association stated that even in the face of firearms and firearms related offenses, the 2015 amendments to the Bail Act amounted to a denial of a person's constitutional rights. The Law Association had then called for the repeal of the, ba of the bail legislation. On the 17th of June, 2016, the Law Association wrote to the current Attorney General, Honorable Attorney General, pointing out pretrial detention of persons without bail for a period of 120 days is not reasonably justifiable in a society that has a proper respect for the rights and freedoms of the individual, given the unarguable inability of the criminal justice system to process those who are incarcerated under this legislation within a reasonable time. Incarceration, therefore, amounts to a breach of the right to liberty without due process. Bail is now punitive in nature as opposed to securing the attendance of the accused at court. So there has been discussion in the public forum for about nine years about these proposed amendments. And call me cynical, <laughs> if one looks 
if one looks at the dates, um, sometimes there are other things happening outside of the, the parliament building which may influence the anxiety to, to bring this, this kind of legislation to the parliament. But regardless of the time when it is brought as a lawyer standing here and as an independent senator, sworn to uphold the Constitution, regrettably, I have to say that the weight of the evidence and of the authority in law is respectfully against the mover of the motion that this bill or this amendment should be passed. Um, now, in the media statement from the Law Association that I had read from, I regret to say I had not said at the time, I had not referred to it fully. It was under the hand of the then president of the Law Association, Mr. Reginald Armour SC. Our vice president had then been Mr. Jerry Brooks. And this is, this is a part of it that I had not referred to. Pre-trial detention of persons without bail for a period of 120 days is not reasonably justifiable in a society that has a proper respect for the rights and freedoms of the individual. So you have the Law Association saying over and over again, over many years and with due consideration, that this is the position that they are taking and they have given reasons for taking that position. We have lawyers who, through the then Criminal Bar Association, had gone before a joint select committee and had set out why they opposed this kind of amendment. Because the thing about it, as I said in my last presentation in this Honorable House, is that when we as legislators agree to legislation, what we should be able to have some confidence in is that we are going to see an impact um, of the legislation, and the impact must not be a negative one. As far as I'm concerned, where I stand, regardless of where you, where you are, who you are, you are protected by the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. So to round up um, people and put them in prison, which is already inhumane and so on, as another speaker referred to in his comments, I think it may have been Senator Hussein. You put them in these inhumane conditions for a period of 120 days when they can do nothing but sit there and wait for the 120 days to expire before they can apply for bail, really degrades us. It degrades us as legislators to think for us to sit here and think that that is acceptable for any citizen of this country. Our courts are sending strong messages to us through a variety of cases, saying what you have going on there is wrong. And they are using strong language. And we come here as if we have not heard or we have wax in our ears, and we want to legislate to put more people into that system. You know what I found particularly interesting when these men, um, these eight men escaped from the Golden Grove uh, remand yard? The police officers, I thought it was a horrible thing that people should actually be able to escape from prison. The police officers had a great deal of sympathy for them because the police officers are the ones bringing them to and from court every day. And they were saying, you know, people having to languish in custody for this period of time and so on is simply inappropriate. So while they wanted them caught by all means, they too were appreciative of the fact 
that what is going on in remand yard, and indeed, which may be entirely out of the control of the commissioner of prisons because he doesn't have, he doesn't control the funds that he gets. But for, in this day and age, for us to be running prisons in the way in which we do, I think it is absolutely uh, abhorrent. Thank you, Senator Richards. And then when we talk about, you know, in making it better, like the Americans, warehousing and using lingo like that, you are just going down the same road of inhumanity. Now, I may just have one minute. Right. I had said that when I wrapped up, I would refer to uh, two actual cases. And what I am not going to refer to cases which are before the courts. They are cases which have been concluded, but they are, are examples of instances which happened to citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. One happened to a young man who was a university student driving his dad's van home after um, having a few drinks with some friends and so on. At the Piaco roundabout, he was shot in the back by the police. He was dragged off to the Mount Hope Hospital. The police took him out of the hospital shortly after surgery. And they took him to a police station to try to charge him for criminal offenses. He collapsed. They did it a second time. The second time that they did it, his father begged the police, please just charge him for something, charge him for anything, because I know that with bail, he can come out and I can take him to get proper medical care. They charged him for six offenses of shooting at police officers. Thankfully, the boy's life was saved because he was able to get bail almost immediately and he was taken to a private hospital where he was treated immediately and his life was saved. Now, for me, as a legislator, that saved life has value. It didn't end there. Six years passed while the shooting with intent charges remained before the courts. Well, we know with the new legislation, it might remain in the magistrate's court, but certainly you may not get a trial within a year. He would not have been entitled to bail had this legislation been in existence. Because he was charged with shooting at police officers. They hadn't produced any firearm. They had simply told the magistrate that we were shot at. They didn't show up at any time to support what they were saying, but this is what they had said to the court. So this could have been a life and death situation for one of our citizens who had the misfortune, a university student, to be shot in the back while driving home to his family's house. The second example that I will give you is one which I believe I already spoke about in this house. Family, four children, police come to the house, a firearm is found in the house which they share with another person. Every man jack is arrested, including a four-year-old severely autistic child, so autistic that he kept having seizures while in police custody and the police refused to allow that child or the mother out of the police station. Charged 
mother, father, watchman, and two teenage daughters. You know how that autistic child got out of that station? One young attorney had the guts to pick up the child and walk out of the police station. Having a conscience, being unafraid to do the right thing. Even police women who were there looking on were saying, oh my God, what can we do? But because of, of how the police hierarchy is, felt that they were helpless and hopeless. Now this lady, had this legislation been in place, this lady and her two young children, I think one was 11, one was 13, two girls, would have been in custody for 120 days. Now, whether you have a pending matter or a previous conviction, I think is not the most important thing about this piece of legislation. Because the Bail Act already provides for your entire rap sheet to be given to the magistrate when you come before the court for consideration of bail. In fact, unfortunately, it works very badly for the person who is charged because police officers do not tend to update these, these uh, records. So even if you won your cases, it may come up as a pending matter before the magistrate and then you have the burden to say, well, no, I actually won that case. So that's how it works for, for, for real people outside of this honorable chamber. Now, what also happens is I think we do not have examples of courts abusing their powers, letting people get bail when they're not supposed to, giving bail which is unreasonable. I mean, surely if that were a problem, then I could still see that legislation may be considered or some sort of higher bar may be raised. Senator Truth, you have five minutes. Thank you very much. But we don't have any information like that. All I can say is a pra as a practitioner in the courts, it is no easy thing to get bail. Courts take into account all of the considerations under the Bail Act before they come to their determination. And furthermore, there are many instances when the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions has intervened. And when persons have been granted bail, persons who they, our review may have been gang members or involved in serious criminal activity, even when those persons have been granted bail, there is a provision in the Bail Act for you to go to a judge and have the bail revoked. Or you can go before a magistrate and have the bail revoked. So when we take those things out of the picture, it seems to me, well, I know, uh, you know, I am sure there are those who have greater knowledge of, of the law and so on, and will have much to say about it. But this is how, in my respectful and very humble view, I see this situation. I don't think this legislation is going to solve the problem that we want to address. Instead, it can cause a tremendous amount of harm to individuals in our society. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Madam President. Minister of National Security. Thank, thank you very much, Madam President. Madam President, it is always a pleasure to come to the Senate to contribute, and I hope that this afternoon's contribution by myself is timely, and also that it will provide a level of information that the vast majority of persons, and no disrespect meant to them, in the Senate would not have access to, that only a Minister of National Security who carries the burden of getting security briefings 
and also the burden, and I call it a burden, although it may be a privilege, but it is a burden carrying the weight of the type of intelligence that the Minister of National Security is privy to. I'd like to start, Madam President, this afternoon by just reminding the population and the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago that bail is discretionary. I sat here and I listened with interest and I heard submissions that bordered on the conclusion that there is a right to bail. There is no right to bail. So let's put an end to that immediately. Bail is completely discretionary. The Bail Act creates a discretion for a magistrate or a judge in certain circumstances to grant bail. So we can immediately dispense with, most respectfully, the submission that bail is a right. I heard reference to the Constitution and an attempt to use certain provisions and not the entrenched provisions of the Constitution to argue that there's a right to bail. Respectfully, Section 4 of the Constitution, Rights Enshrined, talks about the right of an individual to life, liberty, security of the person, and enjoyment of property, and the right not to be deprived thereof. And this is the part that seems to be left out, except by due process of law. Once there is a process of law and a due process of law, your liberty can be affected. Furthermore, the Constitution provides, and that's what Section 13 is about, Madam President, for in certain circumstances, the legislator to infringe one's entrenched constitutional rights. There's also, in the Section 5, Protection of Rights and Freedom, there is no expressed provision in here that gives one a right to bail. It talks about the right to be informed promptly with sufficient particularity of the reason for arrest or detention, the right to retain and instruct without delay a legal advisor of his own choice to hold communication with him, the right to be brought promptly before the appropriate, an appropriate judicial authority, and the remedy of habeas corpus for the determination of validity of detention. It talks at, at, at subsection five, to deprive a person charged with criminal offense of the right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty according to law. But this shall not invalidate a law by reason only that the law imposes on any such person the burden of proving particular facts. You have a right to a fair and public hearing, a right to reasonable bail without just cause. I suspect that is the provision to which senators, honorable senators, are referring. But it starts off with the proviso that parliament may not deprive a person charged with a criminal offense of the right to reasonable bail without just cause. And this whole debate here this afternoon, Madam President, with the greatest of respect, is a submission by the government on behalf of not only the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago and the law-abiding citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, but most importantly, we have come here today at the behest of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, who constitutionally are the persons charged with the responsibility of upholding the criminal laws of Trinidad and Tobago and protecting and serving us as citizens. There's a constant submission, rightly so, by members of the public, that the government has a responsibility to do what it can to protect its citizens and to secure its citizens and to provide security for its citizens. However, we as legislators have our hands tied. We can't go out there and arrest persons. We can't go out there and investigate and bring criminal charges. No, constitutionally, the body charged with that responsibility, Madam President, as I'm sure everyone in this Senate knows, are the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. So I was listening to senior counsel's chote and her contribution, as we all know, she's a senior criminal bar practitioner, and she kept referring to a number of historical press releases, for example, from the Law Association. I'd like to refer to a very current media release, dated June 11th, 2019, that re was released by the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service a short while ago, specific, Madam President, to what we are here 
in this House debating today. No cop-out needed for bail amendment bill. Commissioner of Police Gary Griffith has noted the concerns in relation to the bail amendment bill, whereby, as with any law, some would say that it should not be enacted as it can be abused by the police. Madam President, he is addressing a specific concern I heard made by a number of contributors here during the course of today's proceedings. He goes on to say, he sees this excuse as a usual cop-out in not doing what is mandatory to enforce and ensure law and order. The police commissioner seeks assistance for such bill to ensure that the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service can defend the rights of law-abiding citizens. This is the commissioner of police who constitutionally, at section 123, is in charge of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. He goes on to say, statistics have shown that in the last decade, over 75% of homicides were carried out by persons with illegal firearms in this country. If this cannot be seen as a catalyst to approve such a bill, then he does, know, know, does not know what is. Presently, anyone who is apprehended with a firearm could be released on bail and be free to possibly assassinate the same person who is the informant that caused their initial arrest. This improper system has proven to be a liability in getting law-abiding citizens to come forward and pinpoint possible shooters with illegal weapons. The commissioner believes that someone who has been arrested for possession of an illegal firearm must not be granted bail. Further, he believes that the possession of an illegal firearm is enough for someone to lose their freedom and have bail restricted for 120 days. The commissioner of police says this approach takes guns away from criminals and gets potential cold-blooded murderers off the streets. The commissioner explains that those who speak about their constitutional rights being infringed should also be cognizant of the right to life, which in fact, the ultimate constitutional right of all citizens. This right is then taken away by cold-blooded murderers, the cold-blooded criminal elements, who are armed with the knowledge that they can walk around with a weapon if arrested, they can be released within 24 hours if the amendment to this bill is not granted. The Commissioner of Police says amendments to this bill would ensure that a criminal is incarcerated for 120 days, allowing victims to come forward with the knowledge and sense of safety and protection that the perpetrator is behind bars, which also lessen the opportunity for reprisal. If someone is in possession of a firearm, it means that they have the intent to kill an innocent person in cold blood. The intent can be as damaging as the action. One does not wait, Madam President, for a terrorist to press a button to have them incarcerated. A criminal with an illegal firearm has the capacity and capability to kill 13 persons in cold blood with one magazine. And 35 lives could be lost in a 35 wrong magazine when they have a semi-automatic rifle, which some of them also possess. When this law was enforced a few years ago, it proved to be instrumental to reduce crime. And the commissioner believes that such a law, if reinforced, can do so again. We should not wait until they commit the crime to take decisive action. This is what is provided a low deterrent, as these criminal elements are aware that there, is lit there are little, if any, consequences the Commissioner of Police says it is high time we start caring about the rights of our law-abiding citizens and not about the rights of criminals. Madam President, those are the words of the Commissioner of Police, who constitutionally is charged with the responsibility of leading the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. It could not have been said better, with the greatest of respect. Madam President, I heard some interesting submissions a short while ago that I'd like to deal with before I get into the, the heat of, of my contribution, the core of my contribution. I heard a suggestion that this legislation is brought today because there's an anxiety about firearms and the effect of firearms. There's no anxiety, Madam President. It is the reality of what we are facing with the criminal element today. Putting persons in jail, this is quoted, putting persons in jail does not take firearms off the street. A firearm will be on the outside working for him. 
The Commissioner of Police addressed that in his, in his release. Madam Speaker, a firearm in of itself does not kill someone. Let us get that clear. It is the person who uses the firearm and easily pulls the trigger aimed at someone, sometimes an innocent person that takes the life of one other. And it, there is an element, anyone, and I'm, I'm surprised I would expect the defense attorneys would be knowledgeable about the concept of shooters. This is a reality that we're dealing with in today's society, Madam President. In today's society, the gangs and the criminal elements have trained shooters and hit men. And those are the persons that we are targeting on behalf of the police and the law-abiding citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. These elements outside there who are very capable of just pulling a trigger and taking an innocent life or someone else's life. And there are statistics to show, Madam Speaker, that these shooters and these elements, once found with illegal firearms and charged, we have many instances of the magistracy and the judiciary issuing very low bail and they're back out on the streets again. And even when the illegal firearms are kept from them and are uh, held by the police for the use as evidence in charging them with whatever it is, including possession of an illegal firearm, the availability of firearms out there remains a reality. And we are not burying our heads in the sand and pretending that there is not a ready availability of illegal firearms out there. Madam President, I'd like to talk about for the period 2013 to 2018, so spanning, and this is not a political football by the government here today. This is not us saying it was this one or that one. This is dealing with the reality of the criminal situation that we face today, because it could be anyone. It could be anyone in here, God forbid, anyone in here, their family, God forbid, someone they know, their family, their friends, or the whole of outside there. And as the Minister of National Security, Madam President, on a daily basis, many times during the course of the day, I am privy to briefings as we take firearms off the street, but worse yet, and it thankfully has not been happening every day, but on many days in Trinidad and Tobago, I am briefed about the taking of a life at the hands of a criminal using a firearm. Let's talk about total firearm offenders and then break it down to repeat offenders. Because this legislation here, Madam Speaker, Madam President, as I'll get to in a short piece of a short while, is dealing with the concept of repeat offenders utilizing firearms and also other heinous crimes or crimes where they have firearms. For the period 2013 to 2018, I'm quoting from statistics provided by the analyst at the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. For that period of five years, 2013 to 2018, firearm offenders, 4,215 offenders. Out of that, there were occasions of 202 repeat offenders. Out of that, within the space of one year of persons being released, there were 44 repeat offenders. And out of that, over one year, 158 repeat offenders. Madam President, the scourge of crime is real. Our citizens are facing the scourge and use of illegal firearms and other heinous crimes such as kidnapping, the worst, one of the worst possible crimes being committed against our innocent children. And that is what this, this bill is here to do with today. To tie it back in to the submission, Madam President, bail is discretionary. But what the police service are asking for is the opportunity, and they have very few opportunities, and they have no advantages. Because the criminal element, by definition, does not care what the law says. The criminal element, by definition, does not abide within the confines of the law that the rest of us law-abiding citizens do. The criminal element, by definition, the vast majority of times, unless we're able to pick up advanced intelligence, have the advantage of being able to commit their crimes without us even knowing they're going to commit the crime. And the use of firearms has become the core pillar of the vast majority, 75% of homicides being committed 
or with the use of illegal firearms in Trinidad and Tobago. If that staggering statistic doesn't affect all of those sitting in this Senate today to compel us to do something about it, I heard the Honorable Senator say, we agree we should do something about it, but now is not the time for but, Madam President. Now is the time for action and decisive action. And this action is not an action being taken by the government of its own volition. This is an action being taken by the government at the behest and the request of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, who are doing their all, and I know that, because I work with them on a daily basis, to try and get ahead of the crime and to try and bring back the statistics with respect to crime. Madam President, yes, there's a presumption of innocence. I also heard it being suggested that if we pass this legislation, it will allow corrupt police officers to then victimize and target persons. Madam President, if you have a corrupt police officer, him or her can use any criminal offense to victimize someone. They can say, and the worst possible one, where there is no bail and there's no discretion of bail, murder. A corrupt police officer, if that is the argument, can go and claim anyone, any one of us has committed murder and put us into that process. So with the greatest of respect, it cannot be that we reject this important piece of legislation in the fight against crime on the basis that corrupt police officers will use it. Even if that is so, Madam President, there are safeguards within the legislation that provide for it. First of all, I also heard it being suggested on my way here by one of the opposition senators that you could hold someone with possession of a firearm but not charge them with possession of a firearm and somehow they will be incarcerated for 120 20 days. Completely wrong, completely wrong in law. What the bail amendment is doing is saying that if you are charged with the offense of possession of a firearm, then you are not allowed the discretion of bail for 120 days. I'd also like the public to note, Madam President, that even within that 120 days, as my friends on the other side who practice in the criminal courts would know, within every 28 days, there's an obligation for you to be brought to court. There's always an obligation on the prosecution to proceed with the matters. The few times that I ventured into the criminal courts, Madam President, I was disheartened to see sometimes the breakdown in that system. And we are the ones who must take the responsibility. When I say we, it's in my former hat as a practicing attorney. Either the prosecuting attorney, sometimes the defense attorneys, and sometimes the courts. Because if we wanted to proceed with the matters, we would proceed. So it is wrong to say that you're just going to languish for 120 days. There is an obligation on all of us, my friend, Senator John Heath, Senator Sophia Choate, SC, would know that there's an obligation. It isn't always carried out, Senator Vera, to proceed with the matters expeditiously. It is time that we put the pressure on the criminal court system, as we're trying to do, to force them to get on with matters. The safeguards in here are that you must be charged with the offense within the 120 days. You must be brought before court. The evidence must be read in support of the charge. If the case is not heard within a year, then you're entitled to, re to, to, to seek bail. That puts pressure on the system. The police are the ones. That is us telling the police, you have an obligation to get on with the matters. What this piece of legislation also seeks to do, or rather seeks to do, Madam President, at section f clause five, it says that a court shall not grant bail to a person who on or after the commencement of this act is charged with an offense listed in part two of the first schedule. And so it's a dual, dual conditionality and has been charged, has been previously convicted of an offense which is punishable by imprisonment. So Madam Speaker, what we're telling the population outside there, and in particular the criminal element, because there is a serious criminal element out there. If I were permitted to tell the public of Trinidad and Tobago exactly what is going on outside of there and what we have in intelligence reports, it would frighten them. And this is what the police service are asking for to be able to convict, to, to combat it. So if you have been convicted as, of an offense previously, 
and then you decide that you're going to continue in your life of criminality and commit these following offenses, one of these or more than one of these offenses, Madam President, then no, and using a firearm, no, you should not be permitted the discretion of bail. These are the specified offenses, and I challenge anyone in the Senate to say that these offenses are not some of the most heinous crimes that could be committed against innocent citizens, innocent persons, and even some who may not be innocent. The first is offenses committed by a person over the age of 18, which is under the Anti-Gang Act. I heard the statistics being quoted here this afternoon, almost on the verge of ridiculing the anti-gang legislation. Madam President, I tell the people of Trinidad and Tobago here, because on a weekly basis, I sit with our heads of security and listen to them and give advice for operations that are taking place under the anti-gang legislation. It is very alive. It has been utilized. There are more than five charges for this year alone. Those five charges were against a gang in the east of Trinidad. We are, we are targeting a lot more gangs and a lot more gang activity in Trinidad and Tobago. The act was not retroactive. So we had to start the gathering of evidence from the time of the passage of the Anti-Gang Act. And that was one of the hamstrings, but the right hamstring being taken in the passage of the anti-gang legislation. The work is underway. I guarantee this country, standing here today, that they will see more charges and serious charges under the anti-gang legislation before the end of this year. And the police service are utilizing the anti-gang legislation. An offense under the Offenses Against the Person Act, which is punishable by imprisonment for a term of 10 years or more. Of course, those are the most serious of types of, of, of offenses committed against persons. An offense under the Dangerous Drugs Act, which is punishable by imprisonment for a term of 10 years. So this does not capture the persons who are just in possession for use and the persons who are recreationally using drugs. This is for the big offenders. An offense against kidnapping under the Kidnapping Act. Madam President, we are asking specifically for this one of the Kidnapping Act because we do not want the scourge of kidnapping to restart. I was appointed the Minister of National Security on the 8th of August last year. We had the appointment for the first time in years since 2012 of a permanent commissioner of police in the same month of August 2019. And immediately, yes, this government should be applauded for taking the time, the effort, and doing what needed to be done to appoint a commissioner of police. Shortly after appointments, we dealt with a very high profile kidnapping. If we were not able to solve that, and some of the kidnappings that started thereafter, the scourge of kidnapping could have become an industry once again. We want to send a strong signal to those out there who think a life of crime, and particularly kidnapping, is not one to be encouraged. So if you're held with kidnapping, and I can tell you, Madam President, tell the population through you, gathering the evidence post-kidnapping takes time. And one of the worst things that could be possible is the persons who are part and parcel of the whole act of the kidnapping are out there on bail and still moving around. Because it drink, brings a real sense of fear to the victim. A sexual offense in which the alleged victim is a child including a sexual offense and under the Sexual Offenses Act or the Children's Act. I heard Senator Thompson, who I understand has a great passion for dealing with children's rights, say that she couldn't support this and talk about children's rights. Senator, this bill and our specific inclusion of offenses against children is exactly to address your concerns. Madam President, we do not want people interfering with our young children. And we need to send a strong message because the criminal element out there do not care. I can tell everyone here without fear of contradiction, the hardened criminals outside there do not care. They would be released on bail this afternoon and by tonight, between the hours of midnight and four o'clock in the morning, they would be back at it again. And those, and those who, engage in criminal activity against our children. Let us send a strong message. I'll get to what remand the hand look, looks like. Let them stay incarcerated for the 120 days, but it puts an obligation on the prosecutorial arm 
of the state to carry out the charges and to get on with it during that period of time. An offense under the Anti-Terrorism Act. Well, I agree with the contributors before, the Attorney General, Senator Choate, and others who said there's only one charge and none last year. Thank God. But it does not mean that it does not exist. It does not mean that it is not going on outside there. I can tell you all that one charge, what it was. It was a person who has some element of instability that wanted to assassinate a high profile public official. And when we found him, fortunately in time, and interrogated his devices, the type of information, electronic information contained on those devices was frightening. When we dealt last year with the terror threat that was real, the type of evidence, the type of information that we found electronically was frightening. How to behead people, how to attack a convoy, how to make bombs. These are the type of people that we want to walk in, be charged, and walk back out. These are the type of people that we want, Madam President, to just have the greatest of liberty. The answer is no. Those on this side don't want it. In the United Kingdom, in Australia, when I was there and met with all of the special. has 13 more minutes of speaking time. And I would ask members to allow those who wish to listen to the minister to be able to hear him. Continue, Minister. Thank you very much, Madam, Speaker, Madam President. The answer is no. In Australia, they have legislation. I wish we could have it here. They have legislation even after persons have served their full term of sentence for terrorist acts. The, the police can apply to a judge for an extension of them being held in custody. I have never heard of such a provision. But it is that they understand very clearly the effects of that one terrorist attack, that one incident. When I met with the New South Wales police and their anti-terrorism unit, the irony of it, Madam Speaker, was less than 100 meters from the building was where the terrorist attack by a lone wolf ISIS supporter took place at a Lindt chocolate cafe. We do not want that to happen here in Trinidad and Tobago. The use of firearms in Trinidad and Tobago is bordering on committing terrorism against the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Just to deal, Madam, Speaker, as I, Madam President, as I heard you say, I only have a few minutes left. This legislation is to prevent the ability of persons who have committed what we believe are the most heinous of crimes against innocent people, no bail for 120 days. More importantly, it's legislation that is, yes, there's no anxiety against firearms. It's the reality of illegal firearms. The day one of us in here faces a number of persons with illegal firearms, pointing them in our direction, and know that we're shot and killed, and that person, or we're shot at, and that person can go to court the next day being charged with possession of a firearm, and then be out on bail the following day. Is that when we would react? We have a responsibility now to act. The citizens are calling on us now to act. The citizens are calling on the legislators to do something to help in the fight against crime, to support the police. We sit here and we listen that we're not supporting the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. What can we do to support the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, apart from physical, uh, legislation, physical resources? I just started off my contribution, Madam President, by reading the plea and the cry of the police service through the commissioner of police. They are the ones who ask for this piece of legislation. Murders where firearms were used, again from the police service for the period 2013 to 2018. In 2013, total number of murders, 408. Out of those 408 murders, 320 were committed with illegal firearms. 2014, 405 murders. Out of that, 304 were committed using an illegal firearm. 2015, 420 murders committed. Out of that, 340 were committed with the use of illegal firearms. 2016, 462 murders committed. 351 with illegal firearms. 
2017, 495 murders were committed, 377 with illegal firearms. 2018, 517 murders committed, 416 with illegal firearms. Those staggering statistics is way above 75%. In 2013, it was 78%. 2014, it was 75%. 2015, 81% of the murders committed were using illegal firearms. 2016, 76% of murders committed using illegal firearms. 2017, 76%. Last year, 80% of murders of persons in Trinidad and Tobago were committed with the use of illegal firearms. And we as the legislators have the power, the power starting here today, to send a strong signal. So when you walk in the grocery, you walk in the, the park, you walk in the wherever it is you walk. I heard a, a, a member in the other place yesterday talk about walking in the market. And persons look at us and say, what are you doing to make my life safer? And then 10 minutes after leaving the market, two imps come in there with illegal firearms and hold up people and shoot somebody. This is what we could do to start the fight. And that is the reality. I've just read the statistics. Oh, Madam President, these are only the statistics of murder in Trinidad and Tobago. If I were to tell you the serious crimes where firearms are used. And let me tell, with the greatest of respect, Madam President, the population, through you, what is going on outside there. The AR-15s which are a serious piece of gun, are, are, are being used by these criminals. AK-47s, Keltec machine guns and submachine guns. Every criminal out there now has a Glock. Anybody who knows anything about firearms would know 10 years ago, a criminal is using an old rusty revolver, maybe has three rounds of ammunition. Now, we are finding them with buckets of all sorts of assort assorted ammunition and a Glock that has a 35 round extender. Every criminal outside, that's a semi-automatic weapon that does not stick. And if it is that we are going to sit here and say, it's fine, because the statistics show it. When they're brought before the courts, they're out within a short period of time. Let me briefly talk about the remand yard. I heard them asking, persons asking, quite rightly, for an account of what we're doing. I, as the Minister of National Security, have visited every single remand yard in Trinidad and Tobago. And I asked those on the other side, I heard them talking about the remand yard and what we're doing. Yes, we have begun the work to provide proper toilets, proper ventilation. We have begun that work at Golden Grove on the remand for the 53.6 million. But I want to remind the people of Trinidad and Tobago, and it sickens me as a citizen. It upsets me as a citizen. Anyone driving east along the highway, when you're passing the maximum security, look at a fence, a double fence system oh, yeah. put in by those on the other side for $80 million. If I had $80 million now as the Minister of National Security, what I could do for the prisons, $80 million for a $10 million fence, and they have the audacity to sit here and ask what is being done. Madam President, Tobago, when I visited Tobago. Minister, you have five more minutes. Thank you very much. When I visited Tobago and saw the conditions there, it bothered me because a billion dollars of cash from the NGC was used for a useless wastewater plant that can never be used. We could have built a whole new prison system and a whole new remand, please. Minister, continue, please. Madam President, electric monitoring. Those on the other side are the ones who passed the legislation for electric monitoring. They did nothing to implement it. This cabinet took the decision and approved the award of the contract. Right now, the devices are being fitted. The SIM cards are being outfitted outside of Trinidad and Tobago, and it will be implemented within the next 12 months. Prisons, prison system. The Prison Officers Association is on record as saying that this is the most committed government and Ministry of National Security that they have worked with. $80 million on a useless fence. They did not even buy the prison guard's staff vest. We did it. 
We are the ones who ordered the firearms for us. We, for them, we are working with them to better their conditions. Also for the prisoners, Madam President, we are making more rehabilitative programs for the prisoners. Some of you all might benefit from it. The forensics, the forensics, Madam President, they asked about it. The only person who benefit is the stepdaughter of the... Senator Beaker, please withdraw that statement right now. I withdraw, Madam President. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Beaker. When you withdraw, please, when you withdraw a statement, you withdraw it unequivocally. Okay? Minister, continue. Madam Speaker, there's something called Cambridge Analytics that they use the money on, and that is what they do. That is what they... 46 one irrelevant. Were you really like... Minister, continue, please. Thank you very much. Madam Speaker, forensics. They did nothing with forensics. You know what we have done? We have negotiated with the Chinese government. Minister Moses and I just came back a few weeks ago from Beijing, and they are building a new DNA lab gratis for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. We have, we, the land has been vested, the plans have been done, and we are going to build a new DNA center as well as a new forensic science center, half of it gratis from the Chinese government of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam President, I heard the talk about corrupt police officers. The Commissioner of Police has dealt with that by and large. It is very normal now, but still very disheartening to always hear those on the other side in both houses disparage and attack the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. As the Minister of National Security and as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, I thank the men and women in Trinidad and Pol Tobago Police Service for the tremendous work they're doing under the current Commissioner of Police. Anti -ter you all are good at Googles. Anti-terrorism act, no arrest. Well, I dealt with that before. Trafficking of persons and the statistic that zero charges. I'm not sure when those statistics were. I wasn't privy to where it was being read from. But there have now been charges under the trafficking against of persons, and we have more coming. What we're facing now, it is something we're targeting, we're building out, taking the intelligence now into evidence, and there will be more charges. As I said previously, Madam President, and I seem to be running out of time, I didn't get to deal with some of the provisions I wanted to. There are protections within this bill. Someone is not going to languish in prison unnecessarily. And if they're there for 120 days because they've committed one of these heinous acts, I respectfully say, as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, they deserve it. Because the terrorism that they're committing against our people and against the right-thinking members and against law-abiding citizens with the use of illegal firearms is not something that this government is prepared to tolerate. I thank you very much. Senator Hayes. Thank you, Madam President. With the Thank you, Madam President. I don't think the Minister of National Security, as he ended, as he did, expected that I would be the person to stand to speak after him. Because as he spoke about the opposition, you know, always challenging the police and, the, and that we're always talking down to each other to be a police service. The minister may not know this, but I am from a police family. My entire family are police officers. So while the minister was talking to the commissioner of police to find out what the police wanted, mm -hmm. I was speaking to the operational officers to find out exactly what the police service wanted. Mm -hmm. And now I, I know why the minister, I know why the minister started his contribution with the press release from the commissioner of police. You see, the minister has no popularity of his own to bank on, to sell this piece of legislation. 
So what he's trying to do is have the commissioner of police carry him on his back, as he is accustomed doing at this point. So the Minister of National Security came here, read out a press release from today. No, I, did. I said read out. You should listen carefully. Read out a press release from today um, where the minister claims, the minister claims that the commissioner of police is imploring the legislature to pass this piece of legislation to give the police a fighting chance. Now, let's be logical about this, Madam President. Let's take this entire thing logically. What I did in my preparation for this debate was assess what the People's National Movement as a government promised this nation with respect to crime fighting and reducing the scourge of criminality facing the nation. And the minister, in his, as he began his presentation, stated that the citizens, rightfully so, would look to the government, but it's really not the job of the executive to deal with crime on a day-to-day -day basis, it's the police. But I want to remind the minister very early on with a direct quote from their prime minister and the political leader of their party, when as opposition leader says, said that a government that can't keep a country safe is a government that does not deserve to be in power. He said that a government that cannot deal with the crime problem is in fact part of the problem. And Madam President, so it is the doctor, it is Dr. Keith Rowley who placed the burden, as the minister called it, of fighting the crime scourge squarely on the backs of the executive. And here you have this executive, after making several promises, and I'll go through some of them, uh, because in the promises was not, at no point in time did they tell us, when trying to get the votes of the population of Trinidad and Tobago, that their only actual solution to the crime problem was a systematic erosion of our rights. They did not tell us that. <laughs> they did not tell us that. You see, Madam President, if you were, when we were paying attention from 2013, they were presenting 10-point plans and, and manifesto promises and all sorts of, 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 of promises. Madam President, promises we heard time and time again in every budget contribution of the minister, promises that they have yet to deliver on, and you see them coming today to bank on one thing, and one thing only, that they have put installed a commissioner of police, and they're hoping the work done by the commissioner of police would be reflected by, would be reflective of this government, which is the reason the minister finds himself in every picture with the, with the commissioner of police. But, Madam President, I want to start off by looking at an interesting use of statistics by the Attorney General. Now, I will not fault the Attorney General for the manner in which to use these statistics, because he's an attorney, lawyer. He isn't exactly a, a social scientist or a researcher in that regard, and therefore, when you bring the statistics before us, and you looked at all of the years, and the Attorney General called out the years from 2015, well, 2010 to 2018, and made a very interesting deduction that over the years, the only material difference, according to the Attorney General, is that, in, that there were years when this bail amendment did not exist. And therefore, you place squarely any increases on the fact that people could get out on bail. Madam President, that is, I mean, with all of the wealth of data and research available to the Office of the Attorney General, I would think that the Attorney General must, must, must be able to admit that there must be more input into the reasons we are facing rampant crime in Trinidad and Tobago now. And not quite simply, and I understand that it may be simplification today 
because you have an agenda, you have a specific agenda that you hope to achieve this afternoon. But Madam President, I think it is very intellectually disingenuous to bring before us, mm -hmm. to bring before us all of these statistics and say, guys, you know what? The only problem here, the only difference here is that we didn't have this bail amendment to help us out. And, and the Attorney General called it, he said, the Attorney General said he was asking for a cooling off period, hmm. Madam President. And I wrote that down, huh? a cooling off period. So after four years in government and many, many promises and you know, cri uh, promises and crime plans and whatever else you wanted to call it. After all of that has failed, you come here and say, pass this bail amendment bill to give us a little chance, a cooling off period. Hmm. That is a level of shamelessness that mm -hmm. I really was not yes, expecting. Please. And I want to go to the timing of the legislation, Madam President. 2019 as it is. And I want to start here by referencing an article from the Trinidad and Tobago Guardian newspaper. This article, um, I think it's May 25th. It doesn't give me the actual date here. It says 16 days ago, but I believe it's May 25th. Um, and it's entitled, PNM's Billion Dollar, Dollar Crime Bugbear by Annalisa Paul. And I'm using this article because one, it's a very interesting read. And it starts off with Dr. Rowley as opposition leader. And Dr. Rowley as opposition leader had very interesting inputs. And I'll put some down here. For example, Dr. Rowley, and I'm quoting the article now, four years ago, as opposition leader, predicted the downfall of the People's Partnership government due to its inability to get crime under control. See, that's the anxiety people were referencing. Eh? That's, what it was, that's, that's kind of what we were talking about. Rowley also conceded that spiraling crime had led, the, led to the People's National Movement losing the 2010 general election. End quote. I'll come back to this article. You see, so 2019, Madam President, as it were, you come to ask for a cooling off period. Why is that? Not because there's any genuine desire by this administration Correct. to end the crime scourge facing Trinidad and Tobago. There is not a genuine desire from anyone who presented here today. You know why they're asking for a cooling off period? Because the prime minister, as he was opposition leader, knew then that crime brings an end to that administration. And you have failed for the last four years. Crime has yes. spiraled right. out of control under your watch under your watch, and desperate. now, Madam President, in a desperate, desperate attempt, you say, let me use my state power and snatch the rights of citizens so that I could have a fighting chance at the polls, what Madam President. If that, if, imagine, imagine an executive that would be willing to do that. All right. But Madam President. I'm going to have to caution you eh, in how you are presenting your arguments, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. And when you look at that, when you look at this piece of legislation, because this is not the first time we've had to make the argument that says there's a delicate balance between state power and individual rights, and that we ought not to find ourselves on a slippery slope. And I have made the point before, and I'll make it again here, that this government has been using a nation that is afraid. The, look at the language presented before us today, Madam President. And I want to agree with my Senate, Senate colleagues that spoke before. Crime is, in fact, a major, major problem facing us in Trinidad and Tobago. We are a country afraid. But Madam President, to use that fear, to use that fear, to ask us as citizens to say, we will allow, we will allow our rights to be again systematically eroded to, in exchange for a chance at safety, 
I think is very irresponsible, Madam President. And I heard the Minister of National Security and the Attorney General tell us about the firearms and, 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 and firearms are rampant and if you pass this legislation. But Madam President, no, they didn't tell us how this legislation was going to stop this firearm scourge facing Trinidad and Tobago. So you have before us, Madam President, that if you are charged for a firearm offense, you can be denied bail for up to 120 days. What next? After the 120 days, what next, Madam President? And I want to ask all of my Senate colleagues, everyone sitting here today, after this legislation, after we've debated it, Imagine it was passed. Would you genuinely feel safer? Would you actually, as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, say, aha, uh -huh, I could take the chance now and walk down the street, as Senator Vera spoke about, or that you can go back to your daily life as it were before crime spiraled out of control, if you can remember what such a time was like? Uh, can we really see? that these contained in these clauses before us, in this bail amendment bill, any of them, Madam President, is a solution to the problem articulated by the government, because they articulated the problem, and not one of them said this was the solution, you know, Madam <laughs> President. No, they came and they told us, we have to do something. The time to act is now. When Mr. National Security, Minister of National Security, it's not simply action that the people of Trinidad and Tobago want, you know. They want effective action. You, we want effective action. We would like to feel safe. And the solution that you are presenting before us will not make us feel safe. You corral people, lock them up for 120 days, and, and then what? This is my personal feeling now, Madam President, that the hope is you pass this bail amendment, and you get your cooling off period. And then you come, and you take these numbers, and you run up and down Trinidad and Tobago, and say, look what we did for you. Look at this marginal decrease. I hope you feel safe now. But having no material impact, no real long-term effect after a full term of governance, after a full term of governance, having no material impact, Madam President, that is very disappointing. Now, the Attorney General said, while giving us the statistics, that the decrease in crime that we saw under the People's Partnership Administration, led by Mrs. Kamala Pasad Bissessa, the Attorney General stood here today to insinuate that that decrease fell squarely on the fact that the bail amendment existed in that time. Ignoring, Madam President, a number of other interventions that were put in place by the People's Partnership Administration, significant interventions in the field of national security. So much so, Madam President, so impressed they were with our Minister of National Security that they made him the Commissioner of Police. <laughs> So when you talk, and you know, when you talk about the police, the police want this piece of legislation. Madam President, under the People's Partnership Administration, more than 500 vehicles were pu purchased for the police service, and over 11,470 vehicles were refurbished. And I'm bringing up this point because in the previous debate, last year, I believe, I had to bring up the fact that the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, the officers were being told, drive the vehicle slower or try to make less mileage on the vehicles because they cannot afford to uh, maintain the vehicles to do re regular servicing on Trinidad and Tobago police, police Service vehicles. So before, I think, before you bring bail amendment and say, lock them up for 120 days, the police service would like to have basics to be able to catch somebody in the first place, Madam President. The basics. The People's Partnership Administration 
we instituted those 13 surveillance bays that were on the Trans Tobago Highway. Because you know what a lot of people, when we speak to people, are, are telling us? That they would like to see a greater police presence. They want their communities to feel safe because when they see the Trans Tobago Police Service around, they feel, you feel safer and you want a greater police presence. Let me tell you what's going on now, Madam President, under this administration. Because for some people, the tighten your belt narrative continues. Not for all, not for all, but for some. The tighten your belt narrative continues. You know who some of those people, Madam President? The same Trans Tobago police officers that the Minister of National Security has so much respect for and reg high regard for, mm -hmm. and then does not want to pay them and their overtime. overtime. That's right. Okay. Yeah. No so you say we have they have to they have to you have to come. You you put in the work and we thank you and we have all of this great regard for you. But you know what we don't actually have for you? Money, <laughs> right, Madam President? That is what this government thinks is a solution to the crime situation. So you come here, you read out the press release, as it were, you hope that the commissioner's popularity carries you through, takes, makes this a little more palatable to the population at large, and you do you talk, you, you, you know, you use all these words about the police service and, and the opposition doesn't like the Trans Tobago police service. And, Yet still, you do absolutely nothing for them as a service. Nothing. Madam President, when you look, when I looked at the promises made by the PNM administration, Madam President, first to get into office and then in their time since getting into office, you saw a lot of things. You saw things like, um, the manpower audit for the police service, which was done. But Madam President, this is where I'm saying, when you do things, you have to ensure that it has some impact on the problem you are trying to solve. It is not sufficient to do a manpower audit and put it in a drawer somewhere and have it collecting dust at some point in time. What changes are we seeing affected by that? What, how is it moving towards a, creating a solution which is why, Madam President, I said there is no denial that the government is not interested in a solution, but interested in really and truly what the, the Attorney General called it, a cooling off period, a small blight in the numbers so that they could face the polls with their heads held high, or at least head average, uh, you know, Madam President. In 2019, in the in the budget promises for fiscal 2019, Madam President, and I'll tell you why I went back to this while, getting, while looking at the bail amendment. Because while we talk about, in this, in this um, legislation, while we talk about holding people for 120 days before they have access to bail, a significant part in any of these things working is to increase not just our detection rate, but our rate of conviction. So as you go through the system, are uh, you in fact convicted, convicted of, of a crime? But m before I make this point, Madam President, I, had a, I made a note about the language used in here today. And while pushing your fair, agenda, your fair politics and trying to make sure the nation, you, utilize, you, you try to weaponize the fear of the nation against this this body of people you have blanket labeled, um, labeled criminals, Madam President. My understanding of the system and of the concept of innocence until proven guilty. Yes. Now when you're calling and you're saying this bill gets criminals off the street and we take, we're dealing with the criminals, you're actually not, you know. Because until they are convicted of a crime, mm -hmm. you're not a criminal. So this bill is actually, this bill is saying if you happen to fall within the parameters, we as a state, as a country, want to ensure that we consider you a criminal so we get to just lock you up, Madam President. And that, I personally believe, is dangerous. Yes, I am fearful. Yes, I think things ought to be done to, to, to stymie the, the crime situation and, and provide a sense of safety and security of people of Trinidad and Tobago. 
but we have to be extraordinarily careful, but not with not just what we do, but what we say. Because looking at looking on at leaders in the society saying, yes, yeah, we have to get all the criminals, round round the criminals, but not understanding the process that if before you are convicted, we are willing as a state to label you a criminal, that is very problematic, Madam President. But I wanted to get back to the question of the police service, what they were asking for, why I don't think the bail amendment bill was high on their priority list. Fiscal 2019, the Minister of Finance came to us and promised to create a more computerized, technologically savvy workforce in the Trans Tobago Police Service, and that they would give them, I think, what, what were they promised? Um, dashboard cameras, body cameras, laptops and tablets for all police vehicles, computerization of all police stations, etc. That was a proposal and a promise made. Now, things like that, I think, are part of being solution-oriented. You don't do that, right? You don't report on this, you don't come, and that is a policy directive by an executive. That is the thing that you can do, right, Madam President? That is when you take resources and you allocate it in a sensible fashion towards a solution. You don't do that. You come here at the end of the parliamentary term, complementing the amount of parliamentary time that we have and the reason we have to move so quickly and we have to rush through everything because we're running out of time. And you bring this bail amendment bill, knowing fully well, fully well, in 2017, we told you we are not supporting this. Knowing that then, bring it again in 2019, made no changes, brought nothing to convince us that the situation is different now, and somehow this is the solution now, and telling us about wasting parliamentary time, Madam President. Mm. So, I have another theory on this as well. Because you find, Madam President, whenever the government finds its backs against the wall, whenever they are against the ropes, they like to bring pieces of legislation where they know through conversations with us that we are not intending to support, and then mount a public relations campaign and try to involve us in their bacchanal or the opposition not doing anything about crime. That is your job. Listen to the words of the Prime Minister and you will know that is your job. Right. Where we can do our part, we are doing our part. You know what? The, we are in communities because the United National Congress has said that we will build this nation community by community. And we are in communities. We provide legal services, counseling services, etc. So we are doing our part. And where you can do your part, you have failed. And then now trying to involve us in your back and arm. <laughs> Madam President, I'm going back to the article that I previously quoted, PNM's Million Dollar Crime Bugbear. Uh, I don't have to recite this one, I think. Right. This article, after list detailing all of the promises, most of which were not accomplished by this administration, and highlighting the increase in murder numbers, which is the number that most of us used to gauge over the years, then sought the advice of criminologists. Because, like I said, it's a very interesting read and it's a very thorough, well-researched article. And the um, author, Ms. Paul, spoke to Trans-Tobago criminologist Rene Cummings, who spoke about what we need as a solution-oriented approach to our crime problem. And I would just like to quote what she said. The detection rate reflects a brand of identity a brand identity of law enforcement agency. The business of law enforcement is the, is, is the retailing of deterrence. However, the message being sent is one of impunity. The police must deliver real-time, best practice homicide reduction strategy, augmented with a coordinated, comprehensive, data-driven, national violence prevention strategy that is community-driven, and sustainable. You see, people are willing to help you if you're willing to listen, right? They are 
willing to give you the information to create a solution-oriented um, plan of attack for this crime situation. Instead of doing that, and I have to come back to this article, you bring what is in essence a middle of the road intervention here. Because as it stands for the bail amendment bill, for it to come into this whole criminal justice system, you have, the crime has already been committed. So all of the people that you're trying to protect and all of the crying mothers and the children that you want to keep safe, by the time you get here, the deed is already done, right. Madam President. And now you're telling me the Minister of National Security came forward and said this is about reoffending and make, and then gave us no numbers for that in particular. Right? Did not tell us what are the statistics on reoffenders. You know, they, they, it just it really was what I thought a surface level delivery of the statistics without drilling down deeper. And I suspect it is because they cannot drill down deeper because the statistics do not tell the story they would like for it to tell. Madam President, the criminologist, Rene Cummings, went on to say that the approach has never been scientific. It has never been multidisciplinary, multisystemic, evidence-based, trauma-informed, victim-centered, and focused on best practice. It is my respectful view that the bail amendment bill, Madam President, is none of those things. So a mere presentation of statistics and saying, well, in 2015, when they had the bail amendment, it was a little lower, and in 2018, we don't have it, and it's higher now, Madam President, is not the level of scientific data-driven that we are talking about. That's just not what we're looking for. It's kind of pedestrian in 2019. You know what else is pedestrian in 2019, Madam President? Bringing 2016 solutions, telling us, oh, well, you guys did it. The UNC had a chance to do it. So it's our turn now to give us a little chance to get this cooling off period. Madam President, we are a mature society. We are a society that has entrusted this administration because they made a lot of lofty promises. They campaigned on the reduction of crime. That was all they promised the people of Trinidad Tobago. We will make you safe. We will make you safe. Four years later, you are bringing legislation from our time and saying, hey, this is the solution. So is it that you thought we had the solution then? And therefore you want to regurgitate it and bring it back now? Or is it that you are being disingenuous, Madam President? You see, because the logic, the lines, the dots don't connect with what they're saying and what they are doing, Madam President. And I want to look very closely Madam President, at some of the other interventions that they promised and then never delivered on. Oh, there was another point I had to make. Um, one, I think it's the Minister of National Security or the Attorney General came in to make the usual refrain of the OPVs. Mm -hmm. And you know, if we had the OPVs, the mm -hmm. big if, if we had the OPVs, this would be a utopia. No, Grand Tobago would be crime-free society according to their imaginations, I imagine, Madam President. But in the midst of that fallacy, they came into power, grounded the helicopters, Madam President. And what is happening to the Grand Tobago Air Guard as we speak? They don't know, I'm sure, but I know because I happen to have a fair number of friends who used to be in the Trans Tobago Air Guard. You know why they're not there anymore? Trans Tobago spent a significant of, amount of money training pilots and making sure that they were able to go through the system. We spent money into this program. By VAPs, you come in. Helicopters, expensive. Ground it. No use. Needed them in Greenvale. But anyway, needed them in the prison break. Anyway. 
you made a decision, executive decision, tightening belt again, Madam President. Massive amounts of people who we trained, who wanted to serve Trinidad and Tobago, who wanted to do their national service, trained as pilots, Madam President. They had them sitting down in there doing nothing. Nothing to fly, because the ground only helicopters. Mm -hmm. You know where they are now? They're working in private sector. Well done. And that is government PNM style, and I like to say it. So when you're talking about OPVs, understand that your actions have also systematically crippled our national security apparatus. At Madam President, in their manifesto in 26, the 2016 budget, fiscal 2016, fiscal 2017, they promised the, an establishment of a joint border patrol. Madam President, Joint Border Protection Agency. On the third time this was promised, the only actual allocation was $500,000. This is what I'm telling you about the level of Mamagai. This, this government really commit to engaging in. Time and time again, they brought the same promises on the table. Yeah, the Joint Border Protection Agency, the Police Management Agency, and the Police Inspectorate. They bring it every time, it sounds good. Right, we're doing something for you. Then did nothing, nothing. It just, they bring it back every budget. And that, I'm raising that, Madam President, because if, again, they intended to be solution-oriented, if they really intended for us to be safe as a society, perhaps they could have looked at engaging in these things and instead of engaging in Mamaga and coming and asking for a cooling off period. Madam President, they also spoke of in the, 20, the budget for fiscal 2018 of an offender management program. I think in a large part, when you're looking at re-offenders and you're looking at the statistical data to give you a more informed opinion, an offender management program would be useful. At some point in time, they mentioned it. At some point in time, they shelved it. We will never hear anything again about it. I bet you they will go on days and weeks of public relations that the opposition voted no to bail amendments and they don't care about you and your safety. But, Madam President, you are not uh, to repeat a lot of what you said earlier in your presentation. You're nearing the end of your presentation, so I would ask you to please, you know, raise some new points, please. No problem, Madam President. Um, that point that I was making about the solution, being solution-oriented, was largely because, Madam President, need an explanation as to why you were raising the point. I just need you to take my guidance into account. No problem, Madam President. I was just using it to reorient myself in the, in the space of my contribution. The interruption usually kind of, it throws you off a little bit. So I needed to find back my space and you. So <laughs> re, reorient, reorient myself. No, no, I would never be disrespectful, I would say. No, no. My, <laughs> Madam President, more interruptions. <laughs> um, I had, you know, the Minister of National Security. Oh, thank, thank you, Madam President. Uh, the Minister of National Security came in and made a lot of, he spoke a lot about the constitutionality and whether or not we ought to be afraid or whether it's constitutional, bail, etc. And, you know, what I thought, what I wrote down as the Minister was speaking, was why not talk about the effectiveness? Yes, I know a lot of us raise the issue of the constitutionality, but the reason we'd be raising those issues is because, generally speaking, most people don't think it's effective. So therefore, what is the argument for us to give up our rights and freedoms and, say, what, and to, to, to give you a special majority for this if it's not an effective crime-fighting measure? Now, Madam President, as I conclude, the, there will be, I have no doubt, in the level of predictability of the government, an attempt to say 
that the opposition will oppose anything. I think that has already been disproven. We have given you support when you've done the consultation, when you have acceded to our request for additional consultation, additional Safe scrutiny, guards. safeguards, Madam President. And therefore, the population will no longer buy your empty rhetoric that we are opposing for opposing sake. What we're saying is that the legislation you've brought before us in no way addresses the problem that you've said exists, the problem we all know exists. What we want as citizens of this country are real solutions to the crime problem. This is not it. And because of that, Madam President, we will not be lending our support to this bill today. I thank you. Senator Heath. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity to contribute to this bill and act to amend the Bail Act, Chapter 460. Uh, perhaps I should start by uh, declaring my interests. I'm an attorney at law, private practice. Uh, a large portion of my practice is in criminal law. I do some prosecutions, but primarily I'm a defense uh, attorney. Uh, so that when a bill which, the effect of which will see my potential clients' liberty taken away from them. I have to stand up and pay attention. And so in a real way, uh, Madam President, I'm glad that I can contribute my two cents. They say, whoever they are, that drastic times call for drastic measures. I myself, Madam President, don't necessarily subscribe to that. But something has to be done. And we certainly can't go on the same way in light of our crime situation, which I say is, is multifaceted. I have looked at the proposed amendments, and I must admit that I'm having trouble digesting it. I am not saying that it could not be made more palatable by, by certain amendments. But in its current form, I am certainly, I am not sure it would even achieve the desired results by the movers. I heard the, the Honorable Minister of National Security say that what they were trying to get rid of is someone who is charged coming to court on that charge and walking out literally the next day having obtained bail. It cannot be that with this amendment, the only difference is the person is charged and 120 days later, he walks out, having gotten bail. Something has to be different than that simple, that simple shift in keeping him incarcerated as to when he would get bail. The reality is, a trial the commencement of a trial is not likely to start in 120 days for the simple reason that when it involves exhibits which have to be tested forensically, for which certificates of analysis have to be generated, that by itself is way outside of the 120-day period. Usually, it is the case that until those documents come or are disclosed to the defense attorneys, that the matter is put on a trial footing.
Now, there's a reason why the standard of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a high standard because the presumption of innocence in a democratic society must mean something. I have a problem, Madam Speaker, where potentially someone who has never been charged before in their life can be charged for the first time and has to go to jail for 120 days under this proposed bill. Now, if that was a far-fetched scenario, I would have less of a problem. But the fact is, it's not so far-fetched. Um, my colleague, Senator Choate, would have touched on it. In possession-type offenses, both for firearms and for uh, dangerous drugs, the police often go into, in some cases, a home, or if a car is searched, and everybody goes down and everyone is charged. That creates a potential where persons who are caught in that, who have never engaged the criminal system for anything, can find themselves 120 days in our penal system. If it is our remand, system, remand section, and ironically, the remand part of, of the prison is the worst, and that is where the persons who are still innocent reside. If it was a place where it had a modicum of decency, even for prison standards, that would be all right. But when you send someone to there, they are essentially taken to a hell hole so that when the, the bill is asking us to do just that, uh, Madam President, we have to look inside the bill and see what is there to make for us to feel some sort of relief that notwithstanding the hard stance we are being asked to take, it is nevertheless for the greater good. Now, if I may, um, Madam Speaker, Madam President, just touch on those areas, some of which I would make some suggestions. Others, I would say, it just certainly can't work in its current form. When you look at uh, the proposed Section 5, milady, Section 5 of the Act is amended by repealing subsections 2 and three. Subsections two in the current bill says, a court shall not grant bail to a person who is charged with an offense listed in part two of the first schedule and has been convicted on three occasions arising out of separate transactions. Now I understand uh, what the, the Honorable Attorney General said about the three strikes. It may very well be that when that amendment came in, it was hoped that it would catch a lot of persons who fell into the, uh, who had three prior convictions. But perhaps it didn't. And those persons who are on the police radar have managed to not necessarily evade capture and charge, <laughs> but evade convictions so that they don't, fall, they don't find themselves captured there. I don't know that the answer is to take it, take it out. Even if you, you don't want to say three convictions, <coughs> certainly you can say, look, at least one previous conviction of a like type offense. So if it's firearms, if you have a previous conviction for firearms, well, then no bail. Even if you were to say, I might have trouble digesting it, but if you are charged with a firearm offense and you have one pending for a like offense, firearm, no bail, I will try to digest that. But when, as proposed in 5 subsection 3, 
no grant of bail for simply being charged. That, I, I find it hard to swallow. In the current bill, the, in, in a, assessing whether or not to grant bail, convictions over a 10-year period are not taken into account. And that is not proposed in this new bill. Now, Madam President, that, that sort of make it incongruous with what is the policy now of judicial officers in sentencing. And what is in the current bill really codified a practice amongst judicial officers to disabuse their minds from convictions over a certain age, 10 years. So what you would have happening here is that for bail, I could consider a conviction however old, but when it comes to sentencing you. Senator Heath, thank you. Honorable Senators, we I will sus we'll suspend the sitting and return at 5.30. Senator Heath, you've utilized 10 minutes of your speaking time. So this sitting is suspended until 5.30.